Okay, welcome everybody to CC Animal Health's uh, Educational Moments in Time. And today's subject is From Always Home to Home Alone, Overcoming Anxiety in Your Post-Pandemic Pooch. Our presenter today is Dr. Ernie Ward, and he is an internationally recognized veterinarian known for his work in the areas of general small animal practice, life extension and longevity, practice management and leadership. Uh, I know personally, because I watch Rachel Ray, that he's a favorite on the Rachel Ray show. Uh, more importantly, perhaps, perhaps not, Dr. Ward is the founder of Seaside Animal Care, a national practice of excellence, award-winning small animal veterinary clinic, and doggone healthy, a practice dedicated to nutritional, behavioral, and integrative care in Calabash, North Carolina. He has written many articles, peer review, appeared in many journals as well, and he was awarded the Speaker of the Year Award for both the North American Veterinary Conference, NABC, Orlando, and Western Vet Conference, uh, WVC, Las Vegas, and has spoken in every major North American veterinary conference as well as throughout Europe, South America, and Asia, and he has been a guest lecturer at most of U.S. veterinarian schools. We welcome you. Oh, thank you so much. And it is a delight and honor to be with you today, pet parents of the world. Um, we are going through an unprecedented time. And so, wow, there's a lot going on. And today we want to sort of unpack how do we readjust, how do we reacclimatize ourselves and our pets to this post quarantine world. And that's sort of why, you know, we titled this from stay at home, which most of us have been doing and are doing at least for a few more weeks to home alone, because we're suddenly now going to completely disrupt our dog's lives and our cat's lives once again. And how can we ease that transition? Because I do fear, and I've certainly been lecturing and, and speaking and writing about this to my veterinary colleagues for the past couple of months, I fear that we're going to see this surge in separation anxiety. And so what can we do as pet parents to help, again, maybe allay and overcome some of those anxieties? So the plan today is to review some slides with you, um, kind of go over some, some topics and tips, things I think you might benefit from, uh, and then take your questions. So if you have questions throughout the uh, the webinar today or the Webby, I love that name, I see, see yep. that's a great name, Webby. Uh, just put them in the comment box. We will get to them at the end and there will be people uh, from Assisi right now uh, that will be answering some of those questions as we get to them. Again, I wanna thank uh, Assisi Animal Health for, for sponsoring this because it's really important for us as veterinary professionals to have outreach like this directly to pet parents. And again, thank you for your time today. I'm gonna be very uh, sensitive about it. So we expect, we expect to spend 30 to 40 minutes today. I really wanna get, get to your questions. So um, let's just kind of jump into some slides and. Does that look okay from everybody? Can they see that okay? Yes, it looks great. All right. So uh, the first thing I want to share is just if you want to know more about me, and I would really appreciate it if you would uh, maybe follow me on Instagram or Facebook. I try to deliver content like this uh, as often as possible. Uh, certainly on YouTube, I've got a couple of different channels. Of course, many of you are familiar with me being in the hot car several years ago and then in the cold doghouse. Those are all over my Dr. Ernie Ward YouTube channel. And then I kind of keep up to date on breaking veterinary news on off-label veterinary news and it would really you'd really be doing me a huge favor by following me uh, on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook I again I try to just propagate this kind of information as much as possible out there so what are we going to try to accomplish here in 30 minutes and this is ambitious number one I really want to make sure people understand what separation canine separation anxiety is I think that a lot of times people misinterpret the body language and behaviors of their dogs and they 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 diagnose, quote unquote, it as separation anxiety when in reality it's something else. So I want to walk you through how to tell if your dog has separation anxiety. I want to give you some tips, uh, some of the things I'm doing, uh, certainly with my clients and uh, with my own pets to help reduce after stay at home orders expire the separation anxiety. I want to talk a little bit about some of the new treatment uh, approaches because I do think that that's one of the things Assisi is doing incredibly well is bringing just innovative uh, behavioral products. So I got to tell you, you know, I'm really excited. So uh, I want to 
sort of just start off by framing this. We've been in this exact situation before. The pictures that you see now are from the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. And believe it or not, all over the world, and these two pictures are from news stories in the US, people actually were putting face masks on their dogs and cats because, you know, obviously they didn't have the science and technology that we have now, but they knew that people were getting sick. They knew that it was an airborne uh, infection. And so they were somehow, you know, worried that, wow, I wonder if my dog or cat could get it and be spreading it and so forth. So we've, we've, this is an uncharted territory. Now, obviously, this is much different. Uh, the, the Spanish flu epidemic had a much, much higher, you know, many 10 times uh, more uh, mortality. But, you know, the fact is we've had to hunker down, change our lives, and then try to resume some normalcy. So I, I do take a bit of comfort in that as a veterinary medical professional because, you know, the fact is historically the world has recovered um, from, you know, a really severe and I would argue a more severe in terms of mortality event than, than what we're currently dealing with. I, I want to start though by by sort of reminding you and and I would say you know many of you have a lot of experience in dog training you've done you know a lot of maybe extensive research on your own and so I don't expect that a lot of stuff will be completely unknown to you but my job here is to sort of remind you of the best practices and I want to just remind people that your dog is always learning and I think we forget that you know I call this secret work from home dog school that's what we've been living through right now um, and and there is this myth that's still you know, is somehow perpetrated out there that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Balarney on that. That's just nonsense. You can teach any dog at any stage in life something new. And in fact, they thrive on that uh, because we have bred them to be very trainable, you know, of all the domestic breeds. And look, I have two rescue border terriers and, you know, they are highly, highly adaptable and trainable dogs. And I know some of you are going, I have a Yorkie, not so trainable. But the fact is by domestication over hundreds, if not a couple of thousand years, we have selected the traits in dogs that allowed them to coexist with us most peacefully, harmoniously, and to contribute to our well-being. So all dogs do thrive on work. They want to learn. They want to be rewarded for their efforts. I mean, I really try to tap into that basic instinct. I mean, this applies to humans as well. Many of you that have human children, you know, like I do, mine are grown now. But the reality is, you know, we, we seek sort of this acknowledgement for our efforts and, and we like to be rewarded. And that creates feedback loops that allows us to continue to do those things. Um, so again, you know, I, I kind of call this two minute training. Every day, you're going to hear me say this throughout this presentation, you should take a couple of times just for two minutes and review something. Sit down, stay, come, play, fetch, whatever it may be. Uh, but you really want to set aside, and, and I kind of, you know, this is front of mind for my family, but prior to giving our dogs any food or treat, we do a two-minute training, right? It's just a simple, okay, sit, down, stay, paw, you know, all the little things that you may or may not like to do, but we do have some tricks and so forth. So I encourage you to focus on that because um, it makes a big difference. Um, I do want to sort of start off, if you look, uh, I think it, it'll play over here. Let's just see if we can get this. I want you, as I'm talking, I want you to watch Denver because this is a classic, you know, um, sign of what we call displacement behaviors because people need to understand why does this happen? When dogs and humans even are dealing with stress, they take on behaviors to try to make themselves feel better, to calm themselves, to somehow cope with the situation and psychology and veterinary behavior, we call this displacement uh, behaviors. And of course, um, these are mounting, pacing, vocalization, grooming. We're going to talk about all these things. But for humans, just to put it in context, again, same terminology and same clinical signs, so to speak, um, chewing hair, playing with chewing with hair. You know, you see uh, many, many young uh, adolescent females, uh, human females twirling their hair. Um, and uh, there's actually a condition known as trichobezoars, where uh, some of these uh, young women will chew and ingest, swallow hair, and create a large hairball, which is a trichobezoar, uh, in their stomach. And so, I mean, it's, there's some fascinating research on this. Pacing in a circle, very, very common for humans to do that. And of course, chewing fingernails, not occasionally just chewing your fingernail, but excessively, in fact, causing self-harm. So I just wanted you to understand that, that what a dog like Denver is doing here is actually trying to cope with stress. And by an attempt to cope, we do a different behavior, a displacing behavior to try to help them deal with whatever that stressor or trigger might be. 
Um, I love this, uh, and I've got to give full credit to Assisi for this particular uh, slide. Wonderful, wonderful. And and throughout this, you know, obviously this is sponsored by them, but we're not, you know, this isn't really for by them or whatever. Uh, these slides were done by me, but uh, they've got tremendous tools. So definitely go visit AssisiAnimalHealth.com because I love, love, love this. Uh, the signs of, of CSA, vocalizing. So these are those dogs, uh, like you just saw Denver, the four-year-old, who when they leave, they begin to bark and yowl and yip and growl, uh, but hyper-vocalization. Again, uh, even in infant psychology, you see these self-soothing noises. You probably can relate to that. And so this is what a dog is tr trying to do is to calm themselves. Sometimes it is for attention, of course, but but that is manifesting as more of a neg negative uh, uh, example there. Watchful waiting. Again, like Denver, he's pacing around, looking, staring intently or whatever. Of course, destructive. We've all, you know, probably known a story of a dog that chewed and damaged a table ch leg or chair leg or things like that. Uh, these are the dogs that are just, you know, literally dying to escape. And, and you know, I, I had a dog years ago and just, uh, you know, maybe a pound of sheetrock because it had such severe separation anxiety and it tried to eat its way through a sheetrock wall. Tragic, tragic case. Uh, of course, potty accidents, which we'll talk about in just a second. Shadowing is a, is a really good example that's often overlooked, but these are those clingy dogs. I used to call them Velcro mutts, okay? But these are the dogs that just never leave the owner's side. I could spot them coming into my clinic because this dog is just Velcroed to that client. And so whenever I would observe that subtle nonverbal cue, I would say, aha, this could be a separation anxiety case. Excessively greeting. If you have a dog that literally goes nuts when you come home from work, or maybe you just walked outside to put the garbage out, you know, that is again a sign that this dog is coping and trying to somehow overcome. Wow, I thought you had left me forever. Of course, pacing, panting, and ultimately this can result in self-harm. Now, there is an example there of a dog licking the top or dorsum of its front paw. And so when we see acral lick granulomas, lick granulomas out there, many times I'm going to instantly go in and dive into, is this a behavioral problem at the root of this? Or is it, you know, dermatological or, or something else? Um, again, you know, one in seven dogs are estimated to have this. Some research in the literature says 20 to 40%, but you get a good idea that a lot of dogs are affected. In fact, uh, by the latest estimates, it's upwards of 13 million dogs in the United States alone suffers from separation anxiety. And I will use that word suffer because this is a really tough thing to deal with and live with. Um, the bad news is um, really no long lasting treatments. Nothing works aside from behavior modification. And this is why you see veterinarians like me working with behaviorists and trainers closely in lockstep because we know that if we can't actually do things, maybe it involves pharmaco, you know, th you know, uh, drugs, pharmaco pharmacological treatments, or maybe it's just uh, going to be training, but we know that we've got to modify that dog's behavior or we're just not going to, you know, you just can't give them a pill and fix this problem. Uh, medications currently in the U.S. are used in about 10 to 20 percent of the cases. I've seen reports in the literature up to a third of the dogs. I think that's grossly overestimating it. I think that many people think they're giving like some kind of supplement that they found on Line and they think that that's a medication, but uh, in terms of prescription drugs, it's probably more along the 10% uh, range of that. Uh, again, what I, the part that breaks my heart the most about separation anxiety is the devastating effects it has on a family. These are dogs that wind up being relinquished. These are dogs that wind up being euthanized uh, because the, the family just can't cope with it anymore. And, you know, I, I, I don't judge the, the client, uh, the pet parent in the situation because this is just something that, that they can't handle. They're not equipped. They're not able. So it's just a lose, 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 lose situation for all people involved. Um, and I really want to uh, point out, as you'll hear me say a couple of times uh, throughout this, these are subtle signs that escalate quickly. And one day, something that was just merely annoying is unacceptable. And this can happen in the matter of days to weeks. And I've seen this happen too often in my career. So I want you to today, if there's some, I used to always tell my clients, is there anything that's just that, that Buster's doing that just nags you a little bit, just bugs you a little bit that you just wish, you know, if I had a magic wand, I could just make that little niggling thing go away. Um, that's the one to pay attention to because that little bitty thing that bugs you just a little bit, uh, 
suddenly it turns into a little bit more and a little bit more. And then six months later, it's just intractable. And so we want to be careful. What's not a sign of CSA? Again, nuisance or territorial vocalization. So we did talk about Denver, that first dog sort of pacing, and we talked about watchful waiting. Um, you got to distinguish between dogs that are highly territorial. There are certain breeds, you know, even shepherds, for example, that their job is to watch the homestead. And so they are bred to be highly vigilant. And therefore, you got to distinguish between vigilance, watchful waiting, you know, territorial behaviors as opposed to actual, uh, you know, separation anxiety. Um, potty accidents in an untrained dog. I, I see so many of my pet patients that the owner just has not done a good job with training judgment, I know, but they just really never followed through or they kind of got halfway there and stopped or the dog needs retraining. So there are periods in life where dogs just need to be reminded what potty training is. Regular schedules are super important, which we'll talk about. Uh, and then of course, destruction of food items. I, I had uh, not too long ago, uh, well, a couple of years ago, a case where a dog uh, was repeatedly breaking into a, um, a cupboard. Okay. So they had a little, uh, uh, cabinet area where you know they kept some food stuffs and and the dog's food and treats were in there and just kept chewing at the door and scratching at the door clawing at it you know when they were gone and so the people were like he's got separation anxiety and I was like nope he just wants his food <laughs> you know so we do have to be careful to distinguish between what I would consider a normal behavior obviously you know this is exaggerated but uh, it was a big dog it's like a, a you know pit bull mix um a dog less than one year of age, we're definitely not going to go there and diagnose it with that. Unhousebroken, we talked about that. Medical condition and pain. A lot of these behaviors that look, you know, whining, for example, hypervocalization, you know, um, these can be signs, subtle signs of pain as well. And then, of course, as dogs age, their cognitive function can diminish. And so we have something called cognitive, dysfun cognitive dysfunction syndrome, CDS, which, again, they are forgetful now. I mean, these, this is similar to dementia in older adult, human adults. And so suddenly now that they're pacing at night, their sleep schedule is irregular. All of those types of things uh, lends me more to say, hey, this is probably not uh, going to be that. Um, there is some research that shows certain breeds are predisposed to this. Um, you know, and you see a couple of reports in the literature, but, you know, obviously mixed breeds because they're the predominant breed in the U.S., but pit bulls, chihuahuas, labs, shepherds, uh, golden retrievers, Datsuns, Shih Tzu's, Yorkies, Siberian Husky. Um, and if you see, there's a couple of breeds on there that you instantly get because these are very active working dogs. And if you take, you know, for example, a Husky and put him in an apartment in downtown Los Angeles, you're going to set that dog up for failure. So you, again, um, I think we have to be super cognizant that our dogs have certain traits by breeding and we have to lean into that and then give them that enrichment or they will resort to displacement behaviors and create certain things like separation anxiety. Obviously, the vast majority of these disorders occur in adult, one to five years of age, and two thirds are going to show more diseases like firework phobia, thunderworks, thunderstorm phobias, uh, travel anxieties, right? Stranger fear, I mean, all of those things tend to be commiserate or complicated or in conjunction with separation anxiety. And I you mentioned I mentioned earlier about escalating, right? So suddenly this little annoying behavior becomes unacceptable behavior. Well, often it's a compound effect as well, because suddenly now this dog that's just beginning to show separation anxiety signs now is fearful of strangers at the door, now becomes anxious about getting in the car. Now a loud noise sets it off. I mean, you can see how it quickly snowballs and it really does break my heart. All right. So let's now turn our attention here for the next few minutes to what should we be doing right now. Number one, routine. Dogs need structure. Dogs thrive on having an expectation. And you know, a lot of times my clients will say, you know, Ernie, I don't have a set routine. I can't like do it every morning at 6.30 a.m. That's not really the point with dogs. What dogs look for is what I, again, what I call daily structure, where it's like when we wake up in the morning, the first thing that we do is we go for a walk. I am allowed to go for a potty walk or my father and mother give me a treat or, or feed me or something like that. See, it's not the alarm time that the dog is sensitive to. It's the, wait a second, the past three days we went for a walk in the morning and now no walk? 
right? This can be very upsetting for a dog. Dogs really thrive on structure and routine. So here I mentioned, you know, you need to have some kind of normal wake up, normal come home from work, normal before we go to bed structure. And I, 28 years of practicing veterinary medicine, I can tell you the vast majority, 75% of the behavior problems that I have encountered and had to deal with are the direct result of lack of daily structure. And so when you hear vets say, well, you're like going, that just sounds like common sense. It's easy to say it's harder to execute. So many people fail to do this simple thing. And again, it just completely throws the dog for a loop. And eventually this irregularity, which now is by definition, no regular structure, at least for that dog's perspective, leads them to do displacement behaviors, which leads to habits. Um, you know, I'm the Pet Obesity uh, Guy, so please go to PetObesityPrevention.org. You can find out more about my organization, but more importantly, sign up for our surveys. We ask pet owners, uh, each year we have a survey where we ask your opinions about nutrition and, and treats and foods and all this stuff. So I'd really appreciate your help with that. We have thousands of, of pet parents. Thank you so much for helping us each year. Um, and you may even actually hear my cat. My cat is in my office with me right now. And so she may decide to jump up and join us. You don't know, especially because she thinks that, you know, dogs definitely have all the behavior problems and cats are perfect, of course. But daily exercise is just essential. Dogs are aerobic creatures, just like humans. Cats, not so much. That's why she'd rather just sleep and stalk and pounce. But regardless, you need to make sure that you are giving that dog that 20 minutes, 30 minutes of aerobic activity not only for maintaining a healthy weight, but this is the only way, aerobic exercise is the only way that we've shown in mammalian species, humans and dogs and lab animals and all this, that you can reset all three of the major neurotransmitters. I will repeat that. 20 minutes of sustained aerobic activity, a walk for you, has been proven in numerous studies to reset all three neurotransmitters in your brain. That is why you feel better after taking a walk or a run or exercise. Now, it's an interesting study because remember all of the drugs that we use to manipulate like depression, anxiety in humans and in dogs only can attack one neurotransmitter. So this is why in study after study, aerobic activity beats things like Prozac simply because we can reset all three neurotransmitters. Now this is for mild cases of depression, anxiety, obviously in humans, the, these studies that I'm referring to, but the reality is I believe that daily exercise, aerobic activity has to be in conjunction with behavior modification and of course uh, pharmacology if we need to. Yes, I hear you, Betty. I hear you. Yes, we're giving a, a we're giving a webinar right now. So positive reinforcement. You want to make sure that you encourage good behaviors. You know, I've I've taught my clients, my pet parents, my veterinarians, and of course when I lecture, simple rule: reward the positive, ignore the negative, unless injurious. If you can just go through your day with your dog, rewarding the positive behaviors and giving what we used to call the still face the ignoring, the shunning for your dog when they're doing the, the whining, the pestering, the whatever that they're doing, that's the way to show them what you like. So again, you know, I always say, uh, ignore, they're pestering you. You're on a, you know, Biddy's over here, you know, right? I'm trying to give a webinar and my cat's moving around. Now, cats are different as in terms of behavior modification. But, you know, if this were my dog in here whining, I would continue to talk to you directly focusing all of my intent on you and ignoring my dog. Now, when my dog then quieted, I would give it attention. Hey, good girl, right? Good Jenny. Jenny happens to be one of my dogs. And I would give her a reward in terms of praise or a treat if I had it. Okay. So that's a real simple guide. If I could, you know, if I could tattoo that on my arm or whatever that I don't have a tattoo, but that might be something I would consider. Okay. Uh, what should we also do when we're working from home and this disrupted work life cycle that we're into uh, separate spaces, you need separate spaces for your dogs and your cats and yourself. You know, uh, I'm here in my home office right now. And there are times when my dogs and cats are allowed in here. And there are times when they are off on their own. And so I think I think that's really, really important. Now you'll, you'll see, of course, my cat is in here because she can come in on the other side of this. We have a baby gate 
with a hole cut about this large. So only she can slink through there and that allows her access to the office really whenever she wants. Now for our dogs, this serves you know two purposes. One, they can be kept in. Two, they can be kept out, which again allows separate spaces for all of us. And I think that's really, really important right now as we sort of hopefully end up this uh, quarantine uh, situation. But the reality is you need to all have your own little safe space for sure. Uh, you'll notice I kind of get into cats with darkened rooms, vertical spaces. I mean, uh, my cat, Biddy, you may not be able to see right now, but she has about three layers of shelving behind us. And I find her throughout the day, you know, just sort of, she hangs out on the top, the middle, the lower, you know, the floor, she just does all that stuff. Um, distraction tools are very important. So prior to me coming into this call, I put in my dogs, I have a food puzzle and we have several, of course, the traditional food puzzles that you feed them out of. We also have little toys that you load them with kibbles. And right now they're quiet and working on getting their kibble out of these tools. So these are great tools to have. So again, puzzle food, foods, uh, puzzle, food puzzles, stuff with that. Uh, we also have a variety of snuffle mats. We don't use the snuffle mats for something like this right now for my dogs because quite frankly, they're just too darn fast. And so for them, they go right through it. Um, my cat also loves these feline indoor hunting feeders. Doc and Phoebe's makes a fantastic one. But again, it mimics sort of the hunting. So we put some of her kibble in these little, they look like mice. They're supposed to be like mice. And she bats them around and she has to knock the food out. So fantastic uh, things. Classical music, you know, and dog TV, believe it or not, dog TV is a real thing with some real science to back it. Uh, but I like these things to change the environment, right? Because dogs are highly sensitive to sound. And so if we can play soothing classical music or have dog TV on in the background, again, which has actually very specific tones and cadences and rhythms of music. And I think that you really we're now at a day and age where people are using species specific compositions because the science is mounting up. But, you know, again, just something to fill the space, if you will, from an oral standpoint. So again, I am a big, big fan of classical music. Uh, and, you know, that seems to help with our dogs as well. Daily brushing and grooming. This is absolutely, you know, part of our routine. My wife, you know, definitely spends time with the dog and the cats, you know, just brushing them, you know, grooming them. It's that physical interaction that they see. Of course, we talk about using pheromones. Obviously, people are, are used to, to using different things. You can plug in diffusers. You can spray them. There are a variety of products out there. Many of the cat owners are probably familiar with you know, things like uh, Feel Away, and the dog owners are familiar with Adaptil. Uh, these things are fantastic, and they do work. Compression vests, you know, people like there's a wide variety of these. They're like the thunder vest you know, that you've probably seen on TV and elsewhere. Um, some dogs, they do help. Some, not as much. Uh, Calmer Canine, which is actually the newer technology technology I want to get to in just a second because I mean we're talking about electro you know therapy this stuff is amazing and I'll talk about it in just a second um, a lot of people ask me because I do a lot of natural treatments about what about chamomile valerian melatonin I kind of say the evidence is lacking I don't reach for those frequently if a client asks me we'll explore it uh, but they're really not going to be top of my list at all uh, zilkane for sure you know obviously there's been a lot of research on casein derivatives uh, these are milk proteins and if you kind of think oh that makes sense there are compounds in milk that can help calm and have a behavioral calming effect it's milk, right? So it's being fed to a young animal. So I, I do think there's a lot of interesting science around that. Everybody wants to know about CBD for dogs, right? Um, and look, we just don't have clarity from a regulatory or legal perspective. So there's a really good chance that if I were to talk to you about that specifically, I could be in serious trouble, right? These are federal regulations, federal laws. That's why your veterinarian isn't talking about it because we could lose our license. But on the other side of that equation, the evidence, while we're getting some evidence, remember people couldn't do research on this stuff until just recently, but until we have more evidence, I'm really you know, careful about it. I think that for some pets that I've worked with, they, it seems to provide some benefit. For others, it seems to provide no benefit whatsoever. So again, that's a discussion to have with your veterinarian. Uh, Anxetane, absolutely. I, I love uh, L-theanine. Uh, I personally take it for cognitive enhancement every day, and I have for 20 years. Uh, and L-tryptophan, there's many, many products now that contain L-tryptophan as a calming uh, sort of supplement. So I'm a fan of both of those. And then finally, I do mention because I get a lot of questions around this Bach flower rescue remedies. You know, I, um, I will tell you earlier in my career, I was much more uh, sort of enthusiastic and stronger advocate for it. 
over you know the past 10 or so years i've had you know as many hits as misses so i definitely tell people that your results may vary. Um, they're incredibly safe, so I, I have that you know, to lean on. But the reality is, I think a lot of times people think, oh, I'll just give my dog this before we travel, or oh, my dog is whining when I leave, and it just, it's not going to solve the problem. But again, you know, I like the natural types of things, which is what, <laughs> why I like things like Calmer Canine, because if I can avoid, you noticed I didn't put the list of, of prescription drugs that I have at my disposal. We have quite a, a growing arsenal of behavior modifying drugs. That's a conversation to have at a deeper level with your veterinarian. So I'm not going to, you know, be in the public saying, oh, you should try this drug at this dosage for this duration. But, uh, you know, those are sort of the, I reserve those for that next level, for the more severe cases. I try to intervene early, uh, recognize treatment as early as possible and move on. But I do like modalities that are sort of, you know, interesting and have some interesting research behind them. And that's where uh, ACC is really just uh, crushing it right now. And so one of the things that they've done is looked at the, the, just quickly growing body of evidence on humans for how we can apply electrical fields to humans. And so many of us uh, in the world of orthopedics have been using these CC loops to improve uh, wound healing for years. So this was just like a, something that I began prescribing, you know, 15 years ago in my clinics. And so we felt like, wow, it really helped with wound healing. Well, if you've been watching uh, lately in the news uh, and human health, especially around depression and anxiety and insomnia, you're starting to see people affix different types of devices around their craniums. And that's actually the similar, you know, me me mode of action that we're applying with the calmer canine. And I would encourage you check out accanimalhealth.com to really look at this. But there's some interesting research behind like applying electrical fields to nervous tissues. Again, we've we've seen it demonstrated lots of evidence to look at, at wound healing, you know, especially like post surgery and so forth. But wow, now we see it has you know behavior modifying effects. It's really catching on in humans. So if you are dealing with depression, anxiety, insomnia, there's a good chance one of your medical professionals has mentioned you strapping on. There's a couple of different name brands out there with different patented technologies. But I really encourage you to look at this because we're starting to see this evidence mount up. Uh, again, you know, what I like is when I see cases like this, and here's, here's Pixel. Pixel had extreme anxiety. Uh, it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And this was kind of a slow burn. This got worse and worse over time. But I will tell you one little cautionary note about that. People we become more accepting, right? So our dog does something that annoys us. And instead of going straight to unacceptable, annoy, 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 annoy. And then we, our annoy meter gets reset, right? So I think we can all relate to that. But anyway, loud noises were a big thing. And when she got triggered, if you've ever dealt with a dog with thunderstorm phobia or firework phobia, loud noise phobia, you know that when they are triggered, they don't just like go back and relax when the noises are done. They're like, they're done for hours sometimes. So the same thing with Pixel. They tried everything. She got, uh, she had other fears. Of course, you can see the escalation and compounding effect here. Uh, and so they started using Calmer Canine and within about a month, this dog was uh, doing much, much better. So I wanna kind of, again, thank Assisi. I wanna jump to your questions because I think that's where we'll have some fun discussions. But you know, Right now, they're offering you guys a special thank you. I'm sure they'll email you this or send you this or whatever, but uh, definitely check this out. Um, I'm gonna stop that slide now and I'm sure that they will uh, hit you up with that. So, okay, so I think, am I? You're okay. Can you, can you am I back okay? Now you're back okay and you're okay. So All right. Well, well, let's jump into some questions because, uh, and again, don't forget there's the special deal from Assisi. Really, really go and investigate Calmer Canine if your dog is suffering from this because it's cool and it does require prescription drugs, which I like to start with. So what are some of the questions that we have, Carolyn? Okay. First of all, I want to tell you that your uh, initial question about where is everybody, you have covered the universe, <laughs> literally from North uh, Coast to East Coast and wow. up through Canada. Wow. So, uh, and you have a lovely group of people here with some very interesting questions. So uh, as a result of the health survey, uh, let me get to that question, read common breeds with SA, uh, et cetera, online. So we can't see methodology and size of sample. 
Yeah, and that's a great point. And that's one you really are going to, I'm going to have to kick back to the ACC group. That's their survey and their published data. So, Carolyn, I guess I'll have to ask you guys to answer that we, question. We, we can also uh, attach to the certificates that they'll get or any uh, follow up information from us that will be attached. Right. So and that's a breaking, oh. that's a brand new survey that was just completed this year. So it's it actually the, I think we're going to see even more sort of conclusions and results out of it. You know, there and, and, is currently a blind double blind going on at NC State. Yeah, and exactly. I can, um, I can actually jump in here. Uh, so for the survey with the separation anxiety quiz, uh, it's been out for several months now and we have tens of thousands of responses. So we're actually working on uh, getting that data presented right now, now that we have a critical mass of tons of information and we're really excited to share that with everybody. Yeah, and it is, it's really, this is sort of groundbreaking research. I think it's gonna serve as a benchmark for, for some time into the future. More importantly though, you know, I people always want to blame it on a breed. And as I kind of carefully couch that, that comment in that, the presentation, there are certain breeds that are gonna have certain traits, tendencies. I mentioned like working breeds, like shepherds and huskies, for example. And yeah. so I said, if we put them in a confined apartment in downtown LA, we're, asked, we're not, we're asking for trouble, right? I mean, there, this is not the environment this dog traditionally would have been raised in. It doesn't mean they can't be raised successfully there, but it requires extensive effort and thoughtfulness from the pet parent. So I really am, I'm, I'm one of those guys that is super careful to blame something or ascribe strong attributes to a breed. We all know there are certain attributes that certain breeds possess, but you know, there are also border terriers that are great swimming dogs. I've got two of them, right? So, I mean, you, you gotta be careful because the environment and how they're raised actually plays probably a much larger role than their genetics. Okay, next. My one-year-old pup has all the signs of separation anxiety, although he loves to be at doggy daycare with other dogs and without me, is that common? It is. And that's a great point. Number one, once they reach the other side of one year, that's when we start to say, okay, they're probably behaviorally mature enough. And what this tells me, and again, without knowing more details, I'm really surmising, but what this tells me is that your dog is craving being a dog and being around other dogs, that environmental, men mental, emotional, physical stimulation of being with other dogs means a lot. So A, I congratulate you for doing this. We believe doggy, we call it doggy camp. You know, we, we really believe it's important part to, to allow a dog to be a dog. Having said that, what you really want to start to focus on is how do you sort of transition away from that. So this is a highly stimulatory environment, you know, with lots and lots of, 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 of activity and dogs and smells and so forth. And how do you transition back down to calmness when you return home? And so I think that I would start to really establish that structure, critically evaluate, say, what am I doing to reward sort of let's ease back into the real world now, because it's sort of like picking up your, your child, your elementary school child from a birthday party. I think we can all relate to that, right? They, they were super jazzed. They got loaded up up on ice cream and cake and now they come home and it's like you know what this is crazy and so they're bouncing off the walls so it's really important that we allow that dog or that child in that example to step down gradually and provide them with additional stimulation so perhaps when you come home and this is some a technique that we commonly use with our clients is we ask them to take the dog home and immediately take it for a walk even if it's a five minute walk we help we believe that helps step down the quote-unquote energy level of that dog so again just really evaluate that structure but I love the fact that you're allowing the dog to be a dog. You're providing that type of enrichment, both from a physical as well as an emotional standpoint. Uh, and I think it's going to serve you well for, for years and decades to come. Next question. What is your opinion on using THC for dogs with severe anxiety? We do adopted our dog and she is terrified of strangers, other animals, and some small noises. Yeah, and again, I am bound by the law. I cannot answer that question. THC is a controlled substance, and where I reside in North Carolina, it's illegal even for medical usage. So I, I'm so sorry. I would encourage you to have that conversation with your veterinarian, but when it comes to uh, banned substances like THC and CBD, which is also banned in my state, uh, I am not at liberty to discuss that, and especially because this is being recorded. So <laughs> North Carolina SBI, you can see I adhered to the law. Well, good for you. <laughs> Five stars for that. Next question. Is Calmer K9 reusable for only so many treatments or can you replace the battery and how long do the results typically last? Would you like us to answer that? Yeah, that would be great. Uh, I, yes, and I can piggyback on. 
Absolutely. So Combra K9 was set up to last for about six weeks because that's the treatment that we use right. for the first results. So the battery clearly lasts through two times a day, six weeks. Many people have already seen by then what they would like to be seeing, and it's obvious uh, that it was working. However, it has a replaceable battery, and we certainly encourage you to use it for another session another complete session, meaning four to six weeks. And our customer service is highly uh, technical and would be there to help you if after a second treatment, you were wondering what to do next. And we have veterinarians who would answer you as well. So wanna continue? Yeah, absolutely. And number one, I, you have, I have to attest the customer service of the CC is just bar none. I mean, so they are there to help. And I think they're really eager to share this technology with the world. On top of that, a uh, couple of things. Number one, certainly most clients are going to see, most pet parents are going to see some improvement within the first four to six, six weeks. If we're not seeing it, there's really two reasons uh, that, that I look at. Number one, were we also doing commiserate behavioral modification? So we were doing all of our other homework and the necessary work needed to try to correct this, this dog's behavior. Because I do fear, like just as I mentioned earlier, just giving a pill will not solve these problems. I mean, you have to do all of this in combination with behavior modification, which really amounts to training and desensitizing. I mean, there's a whole suite of, of behavior treatments that we are you know, initiating while we are doing something, whether it's pharmacology, whether it's drugs, whether it's calmer canine or whatever, you've got to do them in combination. And so I tell people, look, if after four weeks, we're not seeing some improvement, we have to really th rethink what our approach is, right? So um, if, you if I feel that the client and the client feels that they are doing everything prescribed and we're not getting results within four to six weeks, I will radically change. And so that will often mean in my situation, and I apologize, Assisi, but I will probably then begin to reach for medications because my fear and my experience is that these do tend to escalate over time and I run out of time. I also believe that a lot of clients become fatigued by all of this work. And so if they're not starting to see some improvements, I've really got to show them, hey, we can get a win here. And so I try to set firm timelines, boundaries on it. And we say, look, at four weeks, we reevaluate, we shift radically. Four weeks, we reevaluate, we shift radically. Four weeks, hey, things are going great. Let's continue it for another four to eight weeks. Okay, Dr. Ward, I'm going to suggest the following. Our team has access to all of the questions. So for those of you listening, uh, we will ask Dr. Ward uh, of, to answer those questions and we will send those answers to you. And if they are technical questions that are concerned with what's happening with the treatment of calmer canine and any of our ongoing research, we will answer them from a CC. But you have a lot more questions and okay. we have to call Well, time. let's try to get to a couple more. Let's, if there's like any theme lines, you know, trends. There is a theme line. They're wanting yeah. to know how can we prepare for going back to work? What would you suggest we do in the area of behavior yep. and uh, you know, helping people prepare their dog? Yeah, it's a great point. And that's, you know, and I, I probably did a poor job of, of really baking that into it. So this is where structure really becomes uh, paramount and those separate spaces. Uh, right now, I would encourage you to begin doing things like, okay, I'm going to work in my office I've got my baby gates up and you guys are out for the next couple of hours while I make conference calls or whatnot. The second thing is to begin to test. So structure, number two, test. That means walk outside, go for a walk by yourself. That sounds horrible, but do something to show your dogs and your cats perhaps that you can leave the house again and you're gonna be back because it is that reestablishing of trust and so forth. Uh, because what I really fear is that a lot of Americans are just gonna go back to work and their dog hasn't seen them leave the house or leave them alone for, for weeks to months on end. So again, structure, test, and then finally trials. So this is where I would say, you know what, when you need to go to the grocery store, leave Buster at home, trial this out, go outside for longer periods of time, see how they behave. If you can trial it with a, an indoor camera, which are my favorite tools of all time. In fact, you know, we had a, a video of a, of a dog with an indoor camera at Denver early on in this presentation, but I think that's a great way to monitor and see what's happening. I, I have many, many clients who will just go out 
to their car, close the car door, look on their smartphone, look at that camera feed and see what's going on with their dog. What you want to see is the dog maybe pet pacing around, be restless, you know, sort of check the perimeter uh, or so forth for a couple of minutes and then go calm down. That's what you want to see. If you see this persisting, you know, like if you're in your car just doing a, a trial period and you see that, boy, it's five minutes and they're still not, not, easing off. You know, they're still pacing around. They're still watchful waiting at the windows. They're still yipping and, you know, again, being hyper vigilant or starting to excessively groom. I don't want you to sit out there for another 15 minutes, but I want you to give it a few more minutes. And if you're not seeing any break in that behavior by 10 minutes, this is a time to come back in, watch for excessive greeting, ignore excessive greeting whenever possible, reward when the dog calms down, Okay, and this is a great time to, again, give effusive praise and or food rewards. But those are the types of steps I want you to take. We, we apply the same principles every year when it's go back to school time. So just, again, check that out. But I think if you've got structure, start testing it out, trialing it with indoor cameras, extended periods of time, watching what's going on, you're going to be, a, you're going to be fine. Okay, thank you. You answered um, multiple questions with that answer, so that was superior. Uh, and so let's, uh, and you're getting many thank yous that people are dropping off to go back to work today. So they're <laughs> hoping, That's right. That's uh, right. yeah, so they're hoping that uh, indeed we do follow up with the questions they've asked. And of course we will. So thank you, Dr. Ward, very much. Uh, people have loved this. I'm watching, I get to watch the statistics rolling by underneath here. So thank thanks. You. And I know that you'll be presenting to shelters and I'm sure they're going to really be happy to hear very much uh, what you're hearing. So for those of you online who would like to hear another presentation, he is indeed uh, presenting to shelters. And so just email us and we'll add you to that list as well if you'd like to hear more. Thanks very much for everything. Thank you guys. Stay safe. Give your pets a hug for me.